onto the muscular system, at this point we will focus on the appendicular muscles. We will talk about muscles on the trunk, but affect the arms as well as the leg. Now we'll continue with the muscles of the trunk, but focusing on the muscles that move the upper limb. Three of these muscles are mostly anterior. The largest and most prominent is the pectoralis major that forms the chest region. With your arm extended out to the side, the pectoralis major forms the anterior wall of your armpit. This muscle has several motions depending on the position of the arm, mostly adduction and medial rotation of the arm. The pectoralis minor is underneath the pectoralis major. The minor attaches to the coracoid process of the scapula. It's mostly used for stabilization of the scapula and thus the base for any motion of the arm. The serratus anterior begins along the medial border of the scapula and wraps around anteriorly along the ribs. It also plays a role in the stabilization of the scapula while the upper arm makes larger range of motion movement. Now let's look at the posterior muscles that move or stabilize the upper arm. These are the muscles that we will discuss. The trapezius forms the muscles that come down off your neck, attaches to the spine of the scapula, the medial portion goes from the back of the skull down the midline of the vertebral column to the spinous processes. This muscle is involved in lifting the shoulders in a shrug-like manner. It plays a role in abduction of the arm from when the arm is extended out to the side at 90 degrees and lifting it until the arm's up alongside of the head. The latissimus dorsi in green is the main muscle for adduction of the arm, pulling it back down to the side. When the arm is extended out to the side, the latissimus dorsi forms the back wall of the armpit. From this anterior view in green, we can see the part of the latissimus dorsi that forms this posterior portion of the armpit. Underneath the trapezius are the levator scapulae and rhomboid muscles. The levator scapulae lifts the upper medial border of the scapula. That means that if that medial side is lifted, then like a teeter-totter, the lateral side where your shoulder socket is will drop down. There are two rhomboid muscles, major and minor, but we're going to consider them together. Their role is retraction of the scapula as you pull your shoulder blades together. Moving on to the muscles of the shoulder, including the rotator cuff muscles. The main muscles that abduct the arm is the deltoid muscle that you can feel as a cap to your upper arm in the shoulder area, shown in green. The teres major muscle goes from the inferior angle of the scapula to the shaft of the humerus and thus will aid the latissimus dorsi in adduction of the arm. The attachment on the humerus is on the anterior side, so the teres major will also help to medially rotate the arm. From the anterior view, we can see the teres major in blue alongside the latissimus dorsi in green. Rotator cuff muscles are a group of four muscles that help hold the head of the humerus in the glenoid cavity or fossa. Thus, these muscles help to stabilize the shoulder joint. Their position also lends them to help initiate various movements. Supraspinatus, shown in red, is located above the spine of the scapula. Infraspinatus, shown in orange, is located below the spine of the scapula. Teres minor in pink is just below infraspinatus. It is a rotator cuff muscle because its attachment is just behind the head of the humerus, not on the shaft like major is. Finally, in yellow and only seen from the anterior view is subscapularis. One way to remember all four of these muscles is sits. Supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, and subscapularis. You should pause now and identify all the muscles that you can see on these three images. These are the muscles that hopefully you identified from the shoulder. Now let's not forget our other muscles. We have trapezius, levator scapulae, rhomboid major and minor, latissimus dorsi, which we also see here and from this anterior view in green. 
we see pectoralis minor, as well as the serratus anterior. We can also see the cut edges of pectoralis major and the deltoid. The arm is the region commonly referred to as the upper arm. There are three on the anterior surface involved in flexion and one on the posterior surface for extension. We'll start in the middle of the list to the most familiar muscle, the biceps brachii. It's indicated in blue. It has two heads and you can see the split with one head to the coracoid process and the other to just above the glenoid cavity. Biceps brachii flexes the forearm and is the prime mover when the forearm is in the supinated position. In the gym, these are known as bicep curls. Beneath the biceps brachii is a much larger muscle, the brachialis, shown in green. Brachialis also flexes the forearm, but it's the prime mover when the forearm is in the pronated position. In the gym, these are known as hammer curls. Corgobrachialis is a small muscle along the long head of the biceps brachii. It aids in flexion and adduction of the arm. Here we can see the action of the biceps brachii with the forearm in the supinated position. When the forearm is in the pronated position, the brachialis is the main muscle that will flex the forearm. The triceps brachii on the posterior side of the arm will extend the arm at the shoulder as well as extend the forearm at the elbow. It does these two functions because it crosses both joints. There are many muscles in the anterior forearm. These are collectively known as the flexors and pronators and are served by the median and ulnar nerves. We will only focus on these six muscles to give you a general idea about the movements of the forearm, wrist, hand, and fingers. The brachioradialis in pink is the only one on this list that crosses the elbow joint. It helps the brachialis flex the forearm in the pronated position. You can feel it as your most lateral forearm muscle when in anatomical position. The next two flexor muscles attach at the wrist, which is why their name includes carpi. Flexor carpi ulnaris in green goes along the medial forearm to the wrist. Alone, it will adduct the wrist or rotate it toward your body. Flexor carpi radialis in blue attaches to the wrist distal to the radius. Alone, it will abduct the wrist or rotate it away from your body. Both flexor carpi ulnaris and flexor carpi radialis together will cause flexion of the hand at the wrist. Palmaris longus in yellow is a muscle that not everyone has. Notice that it attaches above the flexor retinaculum. That means when it is flexed, it sticks up very prominently. This is a great example of the palmaris longus tendon. One of the muscles that flex the finger is flexor digitorum superficialis. You can only see a small part of the muscle belly shown in green, but the tendons extend to the middle phalange to help flex the fingers. Pronator teres in pink help to rotate the radius over the ulna to elicit the pronation motion. Pronator teres has a helper that is located distally and deeper under the tendons here. Supinator is a muscle on the posterior side that will do the opposite motion supination. It will flip the radius back over to return to anatomical position and the palm facing forward or upward if the elbow is flexed. You cannot see it on this image, but I wanted to mention it as an antagonist to the pronator muscles. Here are the muscles of the posterior forearm, mostly extensors and mostly innervated by the radial nerve. This abbreviated list is what we will cover here. On the posterior forearm, we have extensors. So in anatomical position, the lateral side will have extensor carpi radialis longus and extensor carpi radialis brevis. On the medial side will be extensor carpi ulnaris. To extend the hand, these three muscles work together. To abduct or adduct the hand, the muscles on the medial or lateral sides must work with their flexor counterparts. For example, to abduct the wrist, 
extensor carpi radialis and brevis along with their flexor counterpart on the other side not shown in this picture must contract. To adduct the wrist, extensor carpi ulnaris along with flexor carpi ulnaris on the anterior side must contract together. The muscle that extends the fingers backward is extensor digitorum going to the second through fifth fingers. The anatomical snuff box is seen on the posterior aspect of the thumb when you both flex and abduct the thumb. This is a dip-like space that is formed by the ligaments of three muscles. The most medial is the extensor pollicis longus, and the most lateral border is made by tendons from extensor pollicis brevis and abductor pollicis longus. Retinacula are connective tissue bands that contain the tendons across the posterior and anterior sides of the wrist. It is through the flexor retinaculum on the anterior surface that the median nerve also travels. With repetitive motion, the friction inside this confined space will lead to carpal tunnel syndrome and irritation of that median nerve. Onto the muscles of the lower limb, specifically the thigh. The buttock region is where we'll find the three gluteal muscles. The largest and most superficial is gluteus maximus. This extends the leg along with lateral rotation. Underneath and more lateral in blue is gluteus medius. This is involved in abduction of the thigh. Underneath that is gluteus minimus in pink, who also help with abduction of the thigh, but also medial rotation due to its anterior insertion on the femur. Along the lateral side of the thigh, beginning from the iliac crest and all the way past the knee to the top of the tibia is the iliotibial band. This is also known as the IT band. Within this long, wide aponeurosis is a small muscle, tensor fascia latte, that holds this aponeurosis taut and help with locking the knee to stand when the anterior thigh muscles, the quadriceps femoris, are relaxed. The group of small muscles under the gluteals are known as lateral rotators due to their common action. In order from superior to inferior, they are piriformis, superior gemellus, obturator internus, inferior gemellus, and finally quadratus femoris. The green gemellus muscles are actually side by side with the pink obturator internus just on top of them. Moving the thigh inward toward the midline is adduction. The group of muscles that performs this motion are pectineus in blue, adductor longus in green, adductor magnus in yellow, an adductor brevis, which you cannot see except for in the deep picture because it's under pectineus in the more superficial muscles. Finally, we can see the most medial muscle in pink, gracilis. To lift the leg, it takes a great amount of strength from a very stable position. The iliopsoas muscle on the upper femur begins as two muscles on the posterior wall of the abdominal cavity and lateral wall of the pelvis. The psoas muscles originate from the lumbar vertebrae and the iliacus from within the ilium. These muscles merge together to form the iliopsoas to be the prime mover in flexion at the hip, lifting the thigh up. The most superficial muscles of the anterior thigh are here. Sartorius is the longest muscle in the body going from the anterior superior iliac spine down and across the thigh to attach medially to the upper tibia. This muscle will lift and laterally rotate the femur while bending the knee to allow your lower leg to rest on your opposite knee. The quadriceps femoris is a group of four powerful muscles that are the prime movers in extension at the knee for the kicking motion. Rectus femoris in pink is the most superficial of these and is the only one to also cross the hip joint, so it aids the iliopsoas in hip flexion, as well as the rest of the quadriceps group in knee extension. The last three vastus muscles only extend the knee. Vastus lateralis in blue, vastus medialis in green, and vastus intermedius not seen because it's under the pink rectus femoris.
On the posterior thigh is a group of three muscles that extend at the hip as well as flex the knee. This group is called the hamstrings. They all originate at the ischial tuberosity, the bone that you are sitting on. Then they extend either laterally or medially to attach onto the tibia. The individual muscles of the hamstring group are semimembranosus and semitendinosus, which attach medially. Biceps femoris, another two-headed muscle, will attach laterally. The final region we will discuss is the lower leg. On the posterior lower leg or calf region, there are several muscles that are involved in moving the foot. We will focus on the superficial muscles. The most superficial muscle is the gastrocnemius. It is a prominent two-headed muscle that starts on the femur and attaches to the calcaneus or heel bone via the calcaneal or Achilles tendon. If you remove the gastrocnemius, you will see a wide, flat muscle called the soleus, as it looks like a fillet of sole. This muscle is also attached to the Achilles tendon. Both muscles, gastrocnemius and soleus, are involved in plantar flexion. Due to the gastrocnemius also crossing the knee joint to insert onto the femur, it is the main muscle for plantar flexion when your leg is straight and your knee is fully extended. If your knee is bent, the gastrocnemius goes a bit slack, so the soleus becomes the prime mover in plantar flexion. On the anterior calf or lower leg, we see tibialis anterior, which lifts our foot up for the dorsiflexion movement. Extensor digitorum longus lifts the toes. You can actually see extensor digitorum brevis on the foot, but we won't focus on that here. An extensor hallucis longus in pink is going to extend or lift the big toe. On the lateral calf are the peroneus longus and peroneus brevis, which is its traditional name. More recently, the name has been changed to fibularis longus and fibularis brevis. These lift the lateral foot to drop the arch down in the eversion motion. These muscles can all be viewed from this lateral perspective. From posterior to anterior, we see gastrocnemius in blue, soleus in green, fibularis or peroneus longus in dark red, fibularis or peroneus brevis underneath it in yellow, extensor hallucis longus in pink, extensor digitorum longus, which is shown just the cut belly, dark blue, and tibialis anterior also with its belly cut in green. For the appendicular muscles, you should know the name, location, and action, be able to identify them by diagram or description for each of the muscles that we discussed.